I imagine that right now you're feeling a bit like Alice. Tumbling down the rabbit hole. This is your last chance. After this, there is no turning back. You take the blue pill. The story ends. You wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want to believe. You take the red pill. You stay in Wonderland. And I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. Deeper Down the Rabbit Hole. Now live. Tuesdays, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. On the Para-X Radio Network. Welcome, welcome, welcome. 
This is Deeper Down the Rabbit Hole, and you are here with Andrea Vitimus and Jason Caldwell. How are you doing today, Jason? Can you hear me? Oh, I'm great, and I'm trusting that everybody's good and awake after those drums. Man! Exactly, exactly. I'm ready to throw down, man. Can't we do a ritual right now? I don't know that I can get possessed and keep the radio going. Um, maybe. We've done it before. Not well. <laughs> Um, that was the Dragon Ritual Drummers, and that of which, which Dr. Dr. Utu is the main kind of headliner. Uh, before we bring him on for a second, uh, again, we're again pimping. If people want to help with the show, we really could use your help. Uh, multiple people uh, who help out with the show usually started to, well, go to school. And uh, so we actually definitely need to help. Um, we're working out exactly what we need, but one of the things we're going to try to do in the near future is uh, we're going to sell some ad space to uh, occult, pagan, and metaphysical stores, and uh, we're willing to uh, give large commissions to people who will help us get that uh, so we can pay for the actual cost of the show and the actual hosting costs and the extra internet bandwidth that we have and a whole bunch of other costs. I don't even think we have anything going on except for convocations in February, right? Where we're going to do a raw and set possession ritual type thing. But outside of that, well, I think we're kind of being quiet for the next couple months. Yeah, we're going to go quiet, man. But Ted, do not think it's not because we're not busy, because we are. No, because it's going to take three months to work out that ritual, so that way we're up to par for convocations, so we can blow everyone away at convocations. You're supposed to, you know, like say, yeah, that's right, or something. Well, I'm looking forward to it, man. Yeah, okay, I'll see. You know I'm hyped up for complications. I know. I know. I know. Let me make sure this is... The chat room is going crazy, and there we go, so I can't hear it. Um, so I want to thank everyone for coming. I know we had a couple last week. We had a run, a re-show. We're also looking for more guests. Uh, we'd love to hear people you want on the show. Um... We're, we're working with other people right now to bring in more staff people, um, like I said, to also help us, really help us kind of with the, uh, who's going to uh, do the author relations and getting people, basically, who's going to get the guests for us, so that way we can uh, more or less uh, concentrate on what we do, which for me is writing books, and uh, writing various materials, and co-producing the show so again we do need your help uh just email me andreavitimus at gmail.com and I, that's about it I don't, do we have any other announcements nothing major just want to let people know you do not have to be published to get on the show but we would like to see material yeah we do need to see some materials and for people for authors we do need a reference copy of the books and the reason we do that isn't because we're greedy because God knows, uh, we only have like about a thousand books in our combined libraries, probably more than more than that, like three thousand. But the real reason is so we can have actually talk intelligently about your work. Yes, it helps you sell it. Yeah, essentially that's it. It helps us sell you. It, it helps us make the show good. Uh, and without further ado, um, that song was awesome. And uh, so let's bring our guest on. Uh, he's, you know, part of. The, New Orleans Spiritual Voodoo Temple. He's part of the one of the founders of the Niagara Voodoo Spiritual Temple, of course, in Niagara. Uh, you know, he's done concerts across the world as, as one of the most sought-after uh, pagan artists. I don't know any festivals that, that wouldn't welcome the Dragon Ritual drummers because, well, they're kind of awesome. And uh, I've had the pleasure to see them at several festivals that I also was teaching at, so... Uh, you know, sit by the fire, drink a beer, or in the case of some songs like that, go get possessed while you're dancing, right? So without further ado, uh, welcome to the show, uh, Witch Doctor Utu. Well, yes, thank you for having me. No. Blessings and greetings. Blessings. So there we go. We, we, we kind of pimped you out as hard as we can. Well, that was an awesome song, by the way. So that was, that was uh, Fonga, and it was, it was great. It really did. That's uh, definitely a, an old standard. That's by no means an original from us, but uh, it's certainly our rendition of it. But uh, yeah, that's a that's a popular tune that uh, 
Baba Tundale Atunji brought to North America mm -hmm. um, that celebrates uh, welcoming uh, you know, tribes and uh, people, villages, when they would approach each other, they would sing that back and forth as a, a welcoming and as a, as a greeting of trust. And uh, we actually heard it sang the most uh, at the Starwood Festival many years ago, and Ian Corrigan, a good friend, was uh, always singing that around us uh, when we would drum with him, and uh, we eventually decided to put that into our, our arsenal and uh, put our own rendition on it, because it's such a, it's got such a beautiful meaning. Awesome. See, see, wasn't that a brilliant choice for an opening song, Jason? Yes, it was. See, there you go. So, which Dr. Utu, were you into voodoo before drumming or drumming before voodoo? Drumming before voodoo and uh, long before voodoo. Um, uh, I was born in Scotland and my father was a drummer in uh, a Prince of Orange uh, flute band. I don't know if anyone's familiar with that crazy cult of the Orangemen in Scotland, but uh, I grew up as my father was a drummer in that. And so I was six years old. I was in that band with him playing the triangle and then moved up to playing cymbals and then uh, always tinkered on drums uh, throughout most of my youth. I eventually did begin to play guitar a lot more, and, but around my mid-20s, uh, I delved back into drumming. World music was fascinating to me. Uh, I just loved the North African and Middle Eastern rhythms in particular, the trancing aspects of them. And then uh, I basically ran into uh, people that I ended up being in a tradition with for a long time, that practiced Sumerian magic out of Texas. And they had a core of people there that used drums for the high magics. and. Uh, so I just fit right in, loved it, uh, just kept uh, following that beat, following that beat, and it was many years after that that I began to drum for, you know, get invited to drum at ceremonies that, that were honoring uh, Orishas or, or Lua, and, but mostly it was when I met uh, Louis Martinet and uh, Priestess Miriam, who are my teachers from the Voodoo Spiritual Temple about 12, 13 years ago, and uh, that's been my house and my pretty much uh, focus and that's what's been to my introduction into the the rhythms of voodoo yeah, new orleans cool. voodoo in particular uh, so by that american voodoo louis was your primary teacher then well he is the spiritual doctor of the temple and yes uh, any moment i uh, spent with louis is uh is cherished i was just yeah. in new orleans and got to spend some time with him uh, back in august and uh, oh he's a great guy man we love him yeah indeed and so, yeah, drumming for me was already uh, part of it, but as it just continued and continued, I uh, started a pagan men's circle here in Niagara that was open to guys of different traditions, and and we were just uh, exploring the drum. It was just such a, a great thing for, you know, it was one of those things that was able all guys to get into and drum and give us something to do to, to you know, work some energy and eventually like our men's circle here we were looking for something indigenous to to work with something that was just that we could make our own and we discovered that there was a myth in niagara falls right where we live of an ancient uh, water serpent that was honored and placated by the mound builders that uh, all through the ohio river valley right up into the northeast past where we live now here all worshipped uh, these primordial giant horned serpents you know, and some of the shamans, they call them the meteor fire lizards, and they're usually horned serpents, and in the Cherokee Nation to this day still, they have a place for the one called the Uctana that carved the mountains of the Appalachians with his horns. And there was one that lived right here in the Niagara region that was honored, a rainbow serpent whose lair was literally beneath the brink of Niagara Falls. But when the Iroquois Nation, who were kind of like the Romans, of the Native American history, they subjugated the entire Ohio River Valley, all the mound builders, kind of brought a new ideology and sort of put an end to that sort of archaic uh, form of worship. And in doing so, all the way up the areas that they conquered, they impl impl emplaced a, a myth of their sky god hero slaying a giant horned serpent and freeing a maiden. And so that is a myth right here in Niagara Falls of an epic battle of their lightning god slaying this huge horned serpent and killing it. But really, that wow. just means that they were subjugating an ancient and a, a more archaic form of worship. So when we discovered that, we realized that this entity, which they called Gassianditha, was not really evil at all. And in fact, when you look back at how the mound builders served it, it was a, a beneficial and beautiful, ancient, powerful spirit. So we began to work with that, and out of nowhere, we just started to realize that, the, the, you know, we, we purposely worked with it to awaken it and to free its shackles and to let it manifest once again through the mist. 
and it has a maiden, you know, consort as well. The Maid of the Mist is named after that, and uh, that, that's his consort that uh, was an offering to him um, a long time ago. And then it just started to be more and more powerful that we said, well, let's, you know, the guys in the men's circle, and we get together once a month, uh, once a month, uh, you know, sometimes we miss a month, but usually a Saturday, a different Saturday every month. We get together and we said, hey, look, why don't we make an offering to this dragon, water dragon spirit, in the form of like a drum opera, one-time performance only, at uh, a place around here that all our pagan friends hang out, and let's do that. And in the rehearsals of that, we decided to start getting delved deeper into this sort of a tribe that was being formed within the tribe of, let's take a mark, everybody that's willing to take a tattoo symbol of this serpent. And when we were doing that, there was a, a tattoo shop here, the guy owned a series of them, and he brought the mobile unit to a warehouse we all had. And he just happened also to be a, a producer of one of the top rock radio stations here in the region we live in, in Southern Ontario. And so he heard the drumming while we were all getting the tattoo done. He's like, why don't you guys come on the radio station, the morning rock station, you know, and, and come and do some kind of a magic spell or something to make the radio station better. And we were like, all right, we'll do that. And so we came on, and literally 500,000 people heard that. And there was a contest, you know, to name this effigy that we gave them, this voodoo doll to sort of, you know, make them a better radio station and so on and so forth. And literally after that, within no time, we were asked to be on a television show. And then out of nowhere, we were asked to be on another radio show that had lots of people listening. So we said, hey, why don't we just record a CD and then, you know, and then that's it. Like, obviously, the, this whole thing, the serpent wants a CD. And let's just keep doing this and see what happens. And literally, it's been 12 years now, and we've never looked back. And that serpent is, no matter what other deities or nations of spirits that we serve or that we make drum offerings for, or other temples or different religions that we've been asked to help facilitate drums, and that serpent, which we call Henan, is our primal focus, it's our primary power source, and that's, you know, every time we cross the border to go play in the United States, we are crossing right over his waters, so we get to pray to him at that moment. Most of our rituals, if we can, we get out to the brink of the falls at weird hours of the night, different times of the year where there's not a lot of tourists, and, and that is where we do most of our magic. That is the serpent that gives us our rhythm, our power, and so whenever we go to represent, anywhere we go, that's why we're called the Dragon Ritual Drummers. That is freaking awesome, man. Right, right. See, thank you for not like using a four-letter word, Jason. <laughs> I didn't. I know. <laughs> you were so close, though, I could tell. <laughs> um, no, that is very, very cool. So, you've been turning around the whole, the whole world, basically. Well, we haven't been overseas. So, uh, uh, you know, we can't say the world. But, you're still uh, international because you got Canada and the U.S., so... Indeed, we're blessed. We, we know we're blessed, and uh, it's not lost upon us. Um, so, one of the things is we, we've had, you know, lots of voodoo assants on the show, uh, but we haven't had somebody who really is that tied to Huntar, and, uh, which is, is the Haitian word for drums, but... Maybe you could tell us about what it feels like when you're in the groove and the spirits are coming down and give us a story about that. Well, we we indeed, in our shows, like we have an arsenal of songs and there's different places we'll play different rhythms. Um, and there are times within one show where we will perform um, rhythms that are from the New Orleans voodoo tradition, uh, some that are from the Ifa tradition, and uh, so we've actually even had people after shows, very few, but it does happen when people say, like, aren't you concerned that you're playing these rhythms and people are going to get possessed? And, uh, you know, like, how can you play a shango rhythm and an ogun rhythm in the same concert, which we do quite often? And, uh, you know, our, the first thing we say, uh, assuming this person isn't really well-versed in magic, is that we say, well, you know, there's plenty of drum troops from other parts of the world that play all kinds of music that honors ancestors and various spirits and deities. One just has to go watch the drummers of Burundi or, or the master musicians of Juca, whoever it is these world music tribal drum troops are that perform these things. So, you know, it is what it is. It's, it's an expression and we're, on, we're not necessarily doing a proper ceremony in our concerts where we're making offerings, and, but we are singing to them and, and we do know that some of these spirits do bless us. They follow us. They are providing this manifestation and all this prosperity and this these opportunities that we get because again our whole no one in our drum troupe is like a hired gun we don't have people that are 
you know, top drummers that we've auditioned and brought in. Every member of our drum troupe has to be an attending member of our Niagara Pig and Men's Circle, and they have to be coming for a while, and then they have to take the tattoo. You know, it's a, it's a gang within a gang, right? And, and so we have, you know, that's our colors, is our dragon tattoo. And so, you know, we are a drum gang, essentially. We, 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 we realize we just made it on the list for the federal <laughs> government for the U.S. right there. Oh, man. Oh. We're, we're probably already on the list, but... We're already on the list because we had to get visas for the first time in the last year, which was a nightmare. But, yeah, the U.S. Department of Homeland Security actually found out who the dragon ritual drummers are discovered that we were, you know, performing in the United States, and in our own defense, when we first started to get invited to play in America, we did call them and said, what do we have to do? And they said, do you have electrical equipment? We said, no. They said, just tell us where you're going. And so, for about five or six years, every time we pulled up to the border with a truck full of drums, where are you going? To this particular festival. What do you got? Drums. You know, but uh, they eventually discovered that we were, you know, selling things, and that we were getting paid, and so on and so forth, so they forced us to get visas. So they know, they're well aware who we are now at this point. But, as far as drumming, we definitely do have a connection to a few of the spirits that we always include in our shows, and they would be uh, Papa Legba, the, the southern crossroads, uh, the, the New Orleans version of Ogun, like his manifestation through that city, he has, his, he has a, a manifestation within that city in its own tradition, and Shango, from the Ifa tradition, is also a spirit that we are blessed with. Uh, we have people that are initiated to Shango, and one of our great friends is Prince Bamadili Bajawa, who's a Yoruba prince who now resides in Canada. He's a colleague and a good friend of mine. We do a lot of rituals together, which, from what I understand, might horrify some people because we literally do do ceremonies where we honor the New Orleans voodoo tradition and his uh, Yoruba lineage in the same tradition, in the same ceremonies, and we do it quite often. Nothing bad has happened. He's danced with his sacred Agungun uh, masker, which has been handed down for many generations. It's a very powerful powerful Agungun uh, costume and he that that Agungun of his lineage of the Royal House of Rebuja has danced to Bambula from the New Orleans tradition has danced to Papa Legba and without any problem whatsoever now we're not trying to say that they're exactly the same traditions but we have done it together many times and we perform concerts together many times and so we're aware that when we're playing it that we have to control the energies that we're calling for us a little bit and we definitely do take some time the night before or the day before the show to have a little ceremony, to have some time, and to make sure that those of us that serve those spirits understand that it's good. But when other people also say, well, I think it was really wrong that you guys played those rhythms at the same time, you know, it happened in Florida. We were, we were down in Florida uh, back in Beltane, and there was two camps there, people that were from Santeria and some people that were from some Southern Voodoo that really had a hard time with the fact that we had performed some of these rhythms. Papa Legba, Ogun, Shango, Bambula, and some of these ones. And so they were like, well, how do you not know, you know, bad things aren't going to happen, then negative things will happen. It's like, nothing negative is going to happen, first off, because we didn't do f perform a full ceremony. But secondly, we did honor them. And this whole trip, the fact that we got flown to Florida, the fact that we are doing what we're doing is all ordained. And so it's all good. The spirits have blessed us. They have allowed us to do what we're doing. And because we honor them and revere them properly with respect and love, and honor them with what we have that we can give them, which is our drum and our sp and our and our power, our ashe when we're drumming, that it is ordained. It's blessed. It's okay. So nothing bad's going to happen, or we wouldn't have been flown down there in the first place because it's all part of the giant manifestation of what we're writing. When we are hitting those drums, indeed, it is the most powerful magical tool that I guess I own, and every one of our members of our troop would say the same thing. We obviously. Our group is very eclectic. Within our men's circle, within our Dragon Ritual drummers members, there are, you know, several paths of people that, you know, have a certain, you know, lineage or a certain, um, you know, favor to a different pantheon or other deity altogether. But again, this is our order that we serve of the serpent, and it's all towards that serpent. Its power, its manifestation, and so our drums are literally probably our most powerful magical tools. Whether we have ceremonial blades in some of us, or we have machetes, or we have staffs, or whatever it is that we use for other workings, our drums are literally our most powerful magical tools. And there are nights where we do see the ecstatic state fly across, and it depends on the crowd. And even sometimes mundane crowds that we've performed at just eat it up. They love it, because we'll tell them what each rhythm is, 
And if we notice that this crowd is maybe kind of like not going to want to see a bunch of guys in white or tribal outfits, then we wear Hawaiian shirts, and all of a sudden we're the the tiki, uh, I, you know, tiki guys that pose no threat but seem to be playing tropical rhythms with good stories. And so sometimes they just respond even more than the pagan crowds or spiritual crowds we play to. They just open themselves up, and the spirits that we're honoring, we're telling the stories. They manifest in that crowd. They manifest, and we see that it happens all the time, and it's. Part of the lore that is with our troop. It's just reality. Something is being called up. We do revere and honor gods, and they do manifest. And that's pretty much why we get hired. <laughs> Man, that's that's awesome. I mean, you are really like ecstatic about what you do, man. We love it so much. I'd be interesting to hear. Interested to hear about the Sumerian high magic done with the drums. I mean, I, I never heard that before, and it. I mean, I know Voodoo uses drums all the time, and so does Ifa and, and various afro korean drums, but, you know, I never heard that combination before. I'd be interested to hear about it, actually, because I'm fascinated by that. Yeah, it, uh, to me at first, it seemed natural, because I was, at the time, immersed and really fascinated by North African, Middle Eastern rhythms. And so, obviously, the, 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 the tradition uh, was recreated, obviously. There's no buddy in Texas that's practicing magic that's been handed down from the, the, the temples that were from those days, obviously. But right. there was still a, a, a good understanding. There was people that were able to visit, the clergy that were visiting with uh, people who worked in museums and had access to to uh, tools, writings, and so we had a good lexicon that we were using, and, and the type of rituals that we were doing were definitely being spoken you know, in the ancient Sumerian tongue, best it could be, but there are scholars that, you, you know, you can learn that, and so we had people within the tradition that were, you know, at least marginally able to uh, use those words of power. And so, to me, it seemed natural, because if you think about it, like, the drum is the most ancient instrument, and, of course, it was used in rituals in ancient Sumeria and Babylon. Absolutely was used. It was used in, you know, the times of Jesus, you know, the, 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 the frenzied rites on the, in, the, in the river when... John the Baptist is, 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 is baptizing people, there was drums being played there. It's, it is part of it. So, you know, it was later on I realized that, okay, I guess, you know, it was just lucky that I happened to run into Sumerians. There's not a whole lot of those traditions kicking around, let's face it, but there happened to just be a drum, a drum presence in there. And there was a very, very proficient drum uh, influence. Uh, some of those guys were my first mentors and really taught me the most uh, about how to drum in ritual how to play the jambe because I'm, I'm old eh? so I remember when the jambe showed up on the neo-pagan circuit because it literally did happen over the course of two years people were playing bongos and congas and strange ashikas and out of nowhere you know boom the war drum got there and that's just become what it was and we were part of that when that jambe scene happened in the southern states and the pagan festivals so once the jambe showed up that's the horse I grabbed and I've, I've just ridden that, that horse to, to, to this day you know it's a good bet, because I think that's the most popular type of drum in, in existence right now with all the, at the pagan circles. Indeed, and we, we play, our drum troupe plays Remo's quite often, you know, and I mean, it's kind of hard to believe. It's not like we haven't contacted Remo and asked for a sponsorship, but they don't seem to think that it's uh, worth their while, but okay. we have played their drums. <laughs> Here's what, Remo, if anyone from Remo listens, you should give these guys a sponsorship right now. We've go. invented we've invented things to play on Remos by attaching maracas and sticks with, with bells on them to hit those heads because they can be played anywhere. And we've indeed facilitated rituals in downpours and in blizzards and where nobody else would have been able to do anything. In fact, like many years ago, there was a, a, a voodoo festival that happened in, in southern Florida. It was, it was interesting. There was a lot of people that were from the... Mem many members of the New Orleans Buddhist Spiritual Temple came to it. Uh, some of my guys from Canada had already gone down to New Orleans, and then we all went over there together. There was people from Palo Mayambe there. There was people from Ifa and from the Florida Centurion community. And so all these traditions are being represented, and each night people were taking turns providing ceremonies for everybody and workshops to understand what, it, what was going on amongst the community and, and what the differences or more more uh, proposal, the similarities that we had. And there was a couple of guys there that were actually quite horrified that Louis Martinet, myself, and our crew all had Remos. 
Now, for one, we they they can take a, a lick in and keep on taking. So if we're traveling somewhere and you drop your drum or whatever, they're indestructible, basically. I've tried. I've kicked them downstairs and everything. They can survive anything. So there we were. <laughs> this guy said, how can you, how can you guys use those drums and actually think spirits would even answer that? They're plastic. They're disgusting. And, I mean, the way this guy was talking, especially to Lewis, I was just standing there listening and, and watching how Lewis responded to this. And, and really he just said, you know, it just that doesn't matter what your drum is made of. It's the spirit that is of you that you're drumming, and what spirit of the drum that enters the drum when you're drumming, and that is the one that in our tradition in the Orleans Voodoo Spiritual Temple, there's a ritual to discover that spirit to make it manifest, and so that you can name it, and therefore it will be attainable to you whenever you perform, whenever you perform a concert or perform a ritual. That's your it's your spirit it comes through the drum and it inhabits any material. But the funny thing was at the end of that, the culmination of that weekend. A torrential downpour of biblical proportions came raining down, and they all had to put their natural John base away. But yet the ritual continued, and the only people left standing was all of us with our remos, and it was fabulous. <laughs> and just go. to watch uh, my master, the smirk, I guess you know, I don't know Lewis is a beautiful person, but yeah, it was interesting that he was able to sort of just look over and be like, "Do you understand now?" Because now. We are serving the spirits that would not have been served tonight, and they manifesting in this circle and amongst this crowd of people, because we're able to drum with these things, and it's actually pretty good, you know. Man, that's awesome. That what is. Is I love when you have rituals where you make people shut up. <laughs> 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 well, that being said, I think it's a good time for us to hear another example of the great music these guys do. Absolutely, absolutely. Let me get that go queued up. Just a second. I had to hack the computer to actually do this, so it's going to take a second to build up. This is the Serpentine Seduction, uh, of course, by the Dragon Ritual Drummers. So, and this is our throwback to the ancient, ancient far and near east. Yeah, I have had a chance to hear this actually live. So, no, it's not live. But you guys get a chance to hear it on our show as well. So here we go.
Welcome back. So that was awesome. Chat, the Facebook chat basically asked me, oh man, I wish these guys taught taught drumming lessons. So there you go, people are loving it. Yeah, well when we are at, at certain festivals, if we're there long enough, then uh, we actually do uh, provide drum workshops and we talk about various rhythms. Uh, the one that we definitely always do is the New Orleans uh, Voodoo uh, Order of Service. And we talk about those rhythms, the ones that have been in existence in that city since the uh, you know, mid-1900s uh, when they began to be kept and continued and, uh, and passed on. So we talk about that, those stories, how those relate to uh, Tapa Legba, Ogun, to the Bambula. And so we do do that. We offer, you know, all kind. Of, we, we actually do a lot of uh, rituals. If they, people want us to, then we'll, we'll provide rituals as well because, you know, that is, at the end of the day, what our group is. We're ritualists and magicians first and musicians and performers second. And uh, the, the line sometimes is a... Is a, a uh, sort of a shady bleed in between there of which one that we are you know sending forth it's uh it's interesting i i can tell you guys are very and i know you guys uh are well versed in the chaos magic so i think you could probably have a good appreciation for that oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> we're well versed in chaos magic and voodoo so there you go <laughs> so we, it seems like every weekend we're doing voodoo stuff playing out the bambula and all the rhythms. <laughs> yeah, that's actually Louis, truth. So it is truth from Louis that we learned. So yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's amazing. Yeah, the Remos again, like with the Remos. Just last week or uh, two weeks ago now, we were in Salem for the whole week of uh, Hurricane Sandy. We were there for the Festival of the Dead. We stay with Christian Day every year. And we played a few of his events, and little did we know the hurricane was coming. And uh, so, you know, the town was kind of shut down for the day when it arrived, and I'm certainly not making light of the destruction and the heartache that that storm brought, but we were able to bring our drums out and literally stand at the beach as the waves were bashing up against us and drummed in the face of that hurricane. It was spectacular. It was exhilarating. It was unbelievable. And uh, That's on my to-do list, actually, I think. <laughs> I r highly recommend it. Do a drum voodoo. in the face of a hurricane? Yeah, do a big voodoo ritual in the face of a hurricane. That'd be awesome. Man. Yeah, I'm probably getting in trouble now. But that would be awesome. That's awesome. Well, what are you going to do? If it's there and you're safe, you might as well honor the power that is there, you know, and at least commune with it and put your drum into that whirlwind of sound of what it was and maybe even try to tame it a bit. Our intent was literally to try to maybe not have Salem completely, you know, we still had to get paid for a few events, so we didn't want Salem to get wrecked entirely, right? So it was, uh, right. It was, and, and all the witches and the warlocks of that town were definitely uh, on high alert that weekend, you know, but uh, it was still Well, amazing. luckily you were safe. That's the yeah. important part. Indeed. So you've been uh, going out to various festivals, and uh, what are some of your most in inspiring, you know, uh, festivals or concerts that you did and in the past, and that where you just felt like, man, this is this is what it's about. Wow. Well, I mean, every one of them is so different, and we we are lucky that a lot of times where we play or, or that we offer something that, you know, we're lucky that predominantly most of the places we play are, are people that are spiritual or at least magical or, or at least open to the realm of spirit. And so, you know, it surprises us sometimes still because we sometimes think still, no matter what show it is, like, well, is this, are we going to win this crowd over? Is this all going to be good? And then ultimately there's people that have life-changing experiences in there. And, you know, we hear about them all after the show. They come and hang out with us and stuff and tell us what they saw, what they felt. And, and we'll get emails for weeks afterwards of, you know, people sharing things and so each and every one of them, sometimes, you know, the smallest one will be, you know, just awe-inspiring of how much people's, you know, the sharing of, of their dance and our rhythm and, and the spirits in between, how, how wonderful that is. And it's, it just, it blows us away, it inspires us, it keeps us religious, that's for sure. And then there's some that are just, you know, the, because of the location and the exotic locale, like, you know, we were, you know, Florida, Salem, like, you know, things like that, just, you know, just the location alone, you're already going to make the best out of it. Um, Brushwood has been such an amazing place to be able to play at for years and years. You know, that's a beautiful place and it's such a, an amazing property that's been going on for almost you know, 30 years, I think it is, that the Brushwood Folklore Center has been there. Of course, Wisteria, you know, we really enjoyed uh, our time at Wisteria a couple of times. Uh, just the strangest things, you know, the strangest events. We were hired to play for 
the uh, Between the World's Gay Men's Weekend at Wisteria for their 10th anniversary because they knew about our our men's circle, you know, connection, and so they said we would like to have a men's group, you know, even if you you know your whole entire troop is not all gay or bi, but we want you guys to be there because you you support male mysteries. And we got there, and we were just blown away by that weekend, like the 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 magic those guys do, and how attentive they were to the show, and just it was just unbelievable. Like every one of them was like somebody that is a is is an elder or somebody who's a leader or or an inspirer of their community, and just the power that was opened by drumming for those guys, we were just blown away, you know. And uh, so it's hard to pinpoint one particular one down. We've we drummed at all kinds of places that have you know really kind of inspired us. Let's just say that, but. Uh, there's been a lot and we're, we're lucky <laughs> so breaking away from your love of the drums is there any time when you're able to get into ri- personal ritual for yourself that that's not involving the drums or are the drums always incorporated in our per- in my personal work here sure yeah we there's times where we aren't using a drum for our internal group magic in fact it's kind of funny when we in our group the dragon ritual drummers because again we're we're you know like a an order within an order quite often our rituals amongst ourselves will only have one quiet drum accompanying because so much of our external work is with so much pounding sound that when we do go and hone ourselves in it's it's quite silent you know other than our words and our song or or invocations but uh so the drums not you know, it's always pre- it's always present and they're always around us, but there are times where we do do rituals quite often where, you know, if it's within our group. Now, obviously, when I'm facilitating voodoo rituals, it's, it's paramount. There's going to be drums and plenty of them. But uh, within, our, within our group, in the order of the dragon ritual drummers, there are times where our rituals are actually quite void of drum because it's really the time that we're able to just channel our spirit and to be wherever it is, outside, inside, and, and hone ourselves down and to just, you know, recharge ourselves so that we can go and hit our drums and... Uh, you know, so there are times that we aren't drumming. For example, just just recently, uh, we spent three weeks uh, working with Santisma Muerte in a way that none of us had as a group before. Now, a, f- a couple of us have an effigy of her or two in their house and have for a while. And all my times serving that spirit at, at, at times, it's been in silence. It's just been in prayer leaving offerings and, and saying and, and doing what seems to be right at the time for to serve that spirit. But then we decided to take the, the most sacred effigy that we had, which is a life-size beautiful one that our drummer uh, Adrian created. We brought that with us for our whole Samhain tour, which started in Canada, ended up in Salem, and then came back here to Toronto, uh, just north of where we live. And that's the first time that we offered her drums on the level that we did. And that was unbelievable, the manifestation and the the... the the desire of Santisma Muerte to have pounding drums was so obvious that it's kind of funny, but our sacred effigy, it got bought. Someone bought it from us while we were in Salem. And, you know, it was a hell of a price. And we realized that, you know, there was people in that city up until the previous times. I didn't realize there was people in the Salem witch tradition that were serving Santisma Muerte, but it seems that the spirit is manifesting right now. So for, for those of us to get around a little bit, it's like in the last year, you just noticed like, wow, everybody is is uh, honoring the spirit right now, or at least trying to, or working with it. To the so point what happened, where, man? Did, did you have a bid war? What's that? Did you have a bid war to keep driving the price of the effigy up? Yeah, yeah. We had a bid war. And then the night that we decided to, uh, well, whatever, it's, it's no mystery. He's posted it. Christian Day, our host, is the one that bought it from us. And the funny thing is, is that night he bought it, he was waiting to go on coast to coast. And so, you know, he, he was in, you know, hanging out with us in his, in his place. He's usually sort of like keeps himself up there, chained away in, in the top of his house. But he was down there with us, and we, we live with him when we're there. So as soon as the, the transaction was done, he's like, yeah, yeah, I'll mention you guys on the air tonight. And so not only did our effigy uh, become so desired that it uh, was bought uh, and gave us some extra prosperity, but then our name was, you know, whispered upon the, 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 the airwaves of one of the most popular radio shows on the planet, right? And so, you know, we had one more performance that we had to do where we were supposed to have that. So when we got back, it was like, okay, well, now we have to build another one, like another life-size one that's got to be just as beautiful as that. They're not exactly the easiest things to build. Uh, you know, you need a wedding, you know, a wedding dress, all the, the skeleton, everything. So, uh, yeah, Christian Day's uh, Facebook page, uh, 
there's a picture of it. It's in his living room, standing beside a stand-up full-size coffin. So it's he's found a good home, and, and he lives right across from a cemetery. And whenever we stay with him, we go out in that cemetery at night, and that's where we kind of hang out. And so we set her up in that cemetery, you know, because she was invited to the dumb supper, to the witch's ball, all the places we went, we set this effigy up and drum. So this is just the first time, even in the years that I've worked with that spirit minimally, uh, that we offered her drums. And wow, like talk about, you know, instant desire and instant gratification. We were like, okay, well, drums drums for Santiza and Muerte, should there ever be a cause, will be <laughs> offered once again on a loud level. Okay, so so you found out that she really likes the drums. I've got to ask, have you, have you ever experienced a spirit that did not like the drums? Hmm, no. No. Um, no. Can't say as I have. Uh, certainly we've changed, like, We've we've drummed for so many different types of traditions that have asked us to help them. Whether and even to the even to Native American, like here where we live, and even actually down the states, there's there's a few different shaman elders, people that were going to facilitate something and said, "Can you guys drum?" Or you know, would you you know drum with us? We've drummed with the the local Native drummers here quite a few times. So when we do that, obviously we're using, you know, we have a huge collection of drums. So if we are needed to perform somewhere where hand drums are used or or, you know, there are no jambes, and we do that. You know, there's times where there's certain ceremonies that we drum for where you don't use our jambes. We use congas and bata drums, you know. We don't use jambes all the time. They're just the, the best thing for us to use in concert. And, you know, if we're, depending on how, you know, what place we're playing, it depends on what we can bring, you know. So we can't always play world music with the instruments, with the exotic instruments, because if they don't have a great sound system there, then it just isn't going to sound right. So we just play drums. But I've never met a spirit that didn't like drums uh, that we've served. And when I say spirit, I mean like in, in the in the realm of deity, whatever they would be. You know, like from Norse to uh, various parts of Europe, they all respond to drums because it is the oldest instrument. It is the instrument that it should be prevalent in every ceremony that is animistic, primal, or or pagan. Really, to be quite honest. Mm-hmm. Oh, I believe it, man. Before there was any kind of strain instruments, people were banning on stuff at minimum. Exactly. Exactly. So, you know, would you like to take a few minutes and tell people what you're going to be doing here in the next couple months and uh, tell tell the folks on the air about your webs various websites and how they can get in contact with you? Yeah, sure. Well, our website is it's pretty easy. It's www.dragonritualdrummers.com. Uh, we are on Facebook, you know, Dragon Ritual Drummers. Uh, people just need to pretty much type that up and you'll see it. It's the one with the picture of us. Um, we're on Reverb Nation. Uh, we're on MySpace, uh, if anyone even remembers that thing, but we still have an active account over there. MySpace? Yeah, really? you remember that? When was that? <laughs> you mean lock, lock up and crash my computer space? Uh, oh, yeah, man. tell me about it. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, that's still active. So we're easy. Our, our website is the best place to go because that has links to all of our, our places. Uh, um, we, uh, links to our iTunes. We're on iTunes now. We, we were not on iTunes for many, many years. We were on it about five years ago for a short amount of time and didn't make any money from it. And so we got out of that. And people had to buy CDs from us. And that worked for us for a long time. But within the last few months, we decided to go back into that realm now and enter the mobile age. So we're on iTunes. But you can still buy CDs from our website. Our... Our year is kind of winding down, uh, to be honest, so this coming Saturday, we will be uh, in Buffalo for uh, the final installment of the series of events we've been doing at a place called the Botanica El Indio, which is a botanica in Buffalo, in the west side of Buffalo, uh, run by Babala Luis Vasquez, amazing people, amazing family. They helped us out, because to be quite honest, and there's no point, you know, we can tell the story now, but the visas that the U.S. Department of Homeland Security forced us to get, we actually had to have a show in America every 30 days or we couldn't get them. And Whoa. so sometimes oh, in the past, there was Whoa. like gaps where, well, we don't have that many shows. Like, what it, And we were kind of winding down this year as it was. So basically, Luis said, no problem. You know, I'll sign uh, any gaps in between there. You guys come here to the Botanica and we'll have offerings and we'll have no. drumming and we'll have food. That's a so, whole other show, but that's crazy. Yeah, yeah, and so it's been wonderful because it's intimate, and you know we get to go there. It's a big place, it's beautiful, and his family and his house they're they're wonderful hosts, they're unbelievable. So you know, uh, yeah, we get to be in there. Their their shop is dedicated to Oshun, and 
so it's just beautiful. That's this Saturday. That'll be our final one of the year. So we're all going there with, uh, you know, with our intent to thank him and give him big hugs and, and big love for, you know, helping us get in there. Funnily enough, too, just before we went to Florida in the spring, when it looked like we weren't going to get our visas because of all the red tape, and, you know, we were kind of shitting our pants, to be quite honest, because uh, the Florida Payne Gathering already bought the tickets, and uh, the visas hadn't come through yet. So we were drumming at a tambour with Prince Bamadile, and, you know, how they say the the healers are the worst patients. We were kind of confused, and he said, listen, you guys serve the river spirits, the Niagara River, the most powerful river in the world. Nothing can stop water. So focus, and he told us something to do when we got home back to my shrine here, when we all got home from Toronto. He said, go here, say this, do that, and remember the water cannot be stopped. They put a dam up somewhere, water will make its way around. And so in the crucial final hours, Bubba Lau, Luis, and Prince Bamadili came to our rescue, kind of re- you know, gave us what we needed. So they were thanking him there on Saturday, and then our next show after that is in Buffalo again uh, on the 14th of of December, and that's called the Western New York Spiral Dance. What a spectacular place this is. It's where Ani DeFranco uh, has her, uh, she bought a church, basically. She used her money and bought this huge church and turned it into a, a music hall. And Man. it's just unbelievable. 100 foot high ceilings, like balconies, and a main crazy stage. So we play that every year. And this year we have an amazing musician called Dixon's Violin that's going to come and uh, play with us that day, too. Mesmerizing electric violinist. Unbelievable. So that's, that's what we have coming up. Our website has all our shows listed. Our website is our hub. And, uh, but that, and then after that, we kind of wind down and figure out what we're doing, you know, because we, we're not exactly sure, you know, because of the, the visa situation now, we have to now plan what next year is going to be. And, you know, we have to decide between flights and, and stuff because the, the visas aren't cheap, right? So. <laughs> no, no. Uh, you know what? I really hope someday that we'll get to New Orleans and hear you guys play while we're probably getting possessed in the New Orleans Voodoo Temple. So, <laughs> well, that, <laughs> with <that's>, Louie. <laughs> that'd be amazing. Yeah, well, I, I do want to cross paths again. Uh, I, men- I heard you guys mention in Convocation, so uh, what, what are you guys doing there? What's the ritual you're doing? Oh, we're doing a set. We're doing a Return of the Sun where Set will fight the forces of Apep in the ritual. Oh, right on. So, Set will... In his original configuration, destroy the forces of oblivion <laughs> that haunt our lives, and till Set can, uh, till Ra can be rebirthed in the sun. Wow. It's going to be fun. It's going to be action packed, <laughs> and at least for us, dangerous. <laughs> Pretty fun. dangerous, yeah. <laughs> fun, action packed, and dangerous, yeah. Okay. It doesn't get any better than that. <laughs> well, well, it could. I mean, you, you know, you have a big party after the dangerous ritual, but then. You know, during, you know. Well, the only other thing I, I guess I can pimp out is uh, is the um, my side temple here, which is the Niagara Voodoo Shrine, and uh, it's a lovely little story because you know my living up here uh, makes me kind of separated from New Orleans quite often. Obviously, it's not reasonable for me to be going be there as often as I'd like to be. So, discovered uh, that the Underground Railroad ended right here. I already was aware of that, but that the Underground Railroad ended in St. Catharines, right where I live. Harry Tubman, who was the conductor of the Underground Railroad, uh, lived here for about 10 to 12 years in this neighborhood right near where I live. That's and, awesome. Uh, so quite a few of the people that came through the Underground Railroad were conjurers, root doctors, uh, and like a whole marsh and North you know, Carolinian Forest, they call it Carolinian Forest Tradition. Since discovered in the last ten or so years, there's other people that are part of this, and we've all united and, and you know um, stayed in contact and shared ceremonies. So that's a whole other little part of North American conjure that discovered that was kind of fading into oblivion, which is sort of my side job here is to keep that pertinent because it's very very animated. Lots of uh, spiritual songs, lots of hand clapping, um, lots of animal totemic powers. Of course, and Harry Tubman was a diviner. Some of her descendants do still live here in this town. Whether they're adopted descendants or not, it doesn't matter. They're they're from her her bloodline. They they live here. They're friends, colleagues, and uh, lots of animals. She was a diviner, you know. So lots of uh, animal uh, magic was used for them to get through the swamps, through the marshes, you know, to get back to, to get to Canada, across the river, and get into freedom. So that's what we try to honor all those spirits in that whole. And so all of the rituals, when we do those for the Niagara Vuda Shrine, which is separate from the New Orleans tradition, is all about, at the end of the ritual, attaining freedom. You know, attaining a freedom of some kind and, and channeling the powers of Mama Moses, Harry Tubman. And so that's why I 
live in the Niagara Voodoo Shrine, and that's what it's named after. It's named after the legacy of the Underground Railroad and the mystery of the North Star and and the journey it took to attain freedom from you know Delaware and Virginia right into the Niagara region in Canada. And that's, uh, awesome. Awesome. Hey, wish Doctor Utu. Please stay on the line. We'd like to talk to you a couple minutes after the show. Andrea, why don't you take us out with another one of the Dragon Ritual drummers, Gang Bang, and Voodoo Beats. Well, this is probably an Aoife beat, but I'm going to take us out with Shango to give everyone a boost of energy, hopefully. See you, everyone, next week. Enjoy the tunes. Thanks, guys. Thank you.